Okay. So this is our third EE503 lecture. So at the, at the end of the second lecture, we have started a discussion of projection matrices. So to define the projection matrices, first of all, we should understand the problem, projection operation. Let's assume that I have n vectors, a1, a2, a3, and the last vector is an. So this diagonal shape represents the span of these n vectors. So it can be also expressed as range matrix of range space of A matrix, as you see over here. So what do I mean by the range space of a matrix? Think about an arbitrary linear combination weight X. So A times X is another vector, which is an element of this space. A times X. Because this is nothing but, last time we have seen this, A1 vector times X1, A2 vector times X2, and A n vector times X n. Where this vector is X1, X2, X n, and this matrix is, well, it's already written over here. So what we see is this, after this multiplication, I get a linear combination of columns. So all possible linear combination of columns gives us this space. Of course, this is an infinite, I mean, this is not a finite, uh, let's say, uh, this is not a finite or closed space, closed set of points. This is an infinite, um, infinitely extending plane. So this is just a simple drawing to illustrate the situation. Okay, so let me erase this part. Okay, and define the problem. So the problem is finding, finding the nearest vector on this plane spent by these vectors. So the nearest point to this point B, which is out of the range space of A. So you have seen this problem many times in earlier courses. But the issue is the following. So in this span, is this the nearest point to B? Or is that the nearest point to B, etc. That is the problem. Well, the issue is the following. First of all, I should need to define this word, nearest. So I need the concept of distance. Distance between points. OK. So I need a distance function. For example, let me, let me write this distance function. Or I may say distance matrix. It's something like this. I have two points, B and B hat. So in our case, B hat is AX. A candidate point, maybe this one, this is B hat, a linear combination. So this is a function from, let's say, n-dimensional space, Cartesian product, because these two vectors are in the n-dimension, to say, real line, okay? A very specific function. So what makes this function a distance? There can be many functions like that. So there are some axioms, metric axioms. So let me, or let me write distance matrix axioms. So let me write them. Well, the first one is, if I have Let me see. And the third one is
So these are all vectors. So I have underbar at the bottom of every variable. Okay. So what is this? So this shows that this distance function is symmetric. Okay. So if I interchange x with y, I get the same result in this distance function. How about this one? This is called triangle inequality. Maybe we can explain this a little further. And this is the condition saying that distance between x and y is equal to zero when x and y coincide. And please pay attention that this is an if and only if statement. So that means that this statement is equivalent to this statement. Okay. So when x is equal to y, I have this. When distance is equal to zero, two arguments are identically the same. So I have such a case. So if I have such a function satisfying these axioms, it's called a distance matrix. So similarly, we have something called norm. Norm function. So let me explain this like that. So what is a norm function? Norm function is, it has a single argument. So this is from Rn to R. Again, it has some axioms. Number one, well, if this is number two, Number three. Actually, I made a mistake over here because these functions are not. I have just realized that from Rn to Rn, two positive reals. Well, or I should say non negative real values. So both the distance function and the norm function map arbitrary vectors to non-negative, non-negative real numbers. So what's going on? Similarly, this is almost identical to this one. So there is also an if and only if statement. And this is also triangle inequality. And this is, you may say, the scaling property. Okay, so how about this one? Alpha over here is just a real number. For example, if this is minus 5, minus 5 times x has the norm of 5 times norm, norm of x. So I have the absolute value over here, and the double bar denotes the norm. Okay, absolute value. Well, you can also understand from the notation. If there is a bar over here, this is a vector, so I'm calculating the norm of the vector, obviously. Okay. If this is if there is no bar over here, it's just a scalar. So I'm calculating the magnitude or absolute value of this scale. So at the end of this calculation, I get a positive number. Because I have already calculated you know, this one, and norm is by definition is positive or non-negative, I should say. Now here is a fact. Assume we have a norm function and define a metric as dxy is equal to x minus y. Question is dxy a valid metric function? Can it be a, well, these axioms are quite similar. But if I define a norm function, this is a valid norm function. And from this norm function, if I define, or this is called, let me write it over here, 
This is metric induced by norm. So it has been let's say, generated from this norm according to this rule. So if this is a metric, then it has to satisfy the symmetric condition. So let me see. If I interchange x with y, then it's equivalent to multiplying the argument of this norm by minus 1, as you see. So if I multiply the argument of this uh, norm operator by minus 1, then alpha is equal to minus 1, then this is just 1, so I get the same norm. So it says that if I multiply this by minus 1, then this part is equal to this part. Okay? So symmetry is satisfied. So let's check this one. So this is the equality condition when x and y. So let's see. When x and y is equal, then I have 0. Well, norm of 0 is equal to the 0 vector. So when x and y is equal, I get this one. I have 0 on this side because when x and y is equal to each other, I have the norm of 0. And norm of 0, by definition, if this is a true norm, is equal to 0 according to this. So other way around, if this is equal to 0, if the norm is equal to 0, then this is equal to 0, then this, sorry, if this distance is equal to 0, then this norm is equal to 0, then if a norm is equal to 0, then the argument should be equal to the 0 vector, then x vector should be equal to the y vector, so this is also true, trivially. How about this triangle inequality in both cases? Well, I can write x minus z plus z minus y. Okay, so this is equal to x minus y. Okay because two z's cancel. Now you can see that this is also equal to well I have used this. So this is a valid norm. If this is a valid norm I can have such a result. Triangle inequality for the norms. But this is by definition well because of my definition dx z this is my you know, definition, dzy, distance between z and y. Well, and this is my definition, distance between x and y. So I get this result. Distance between x and y is smaller than or equal to distance between x and z plus distance between z and y. So this is a triangle in quarter for the matrix. So what do we have as the answer? So answer is yes. So if I can define a norm function, then this norm is automatically inducing a metric. And that is important for us. So we were discussing this problem. Now I can define a metric or a norm and then discuss this distance, minimum distance, according to that cost function, according to that distance that, that, that will be defined. So So right now we have defined the distance. Well, what is the problem then? So I need to find a point over here. So which argument minimizes? Well, I can write this as a distance, but let me use this as a norm b minus b hat, where b hat is element of range space of A. And I will call this b star. Okay. So this is, this notation is, this is the function or argument minimizing this. So this is distance between b minus b hat, distance between b and b hat. So, for example, this is. Now I can define 
this distance by a norm. Okay. So among all of these, B hat candidates, so let's say I have another B1 hat, this is B2 hat, and so on. So I'm looking for the one at minimum distance to B. So that becomes our problem definition. Now there are some questions whether, you know, there is a typical, this is a typical mathematical problem, whether questions. Number one, first of all, is there an optimal B star exists or not? So we don't know anything about that right now. So we are trying to solve this problem. We are saying that this is the solution. Number two, if exists, is it unique? Okay. Number three, so is it unique or not? Number three, if is there, a, let's say, a method, possibly a feasible method, to calculate B hat, sorry, B star, optimal B star. There can be maybe infinite number of these, but is there a way to calculate at least one of them? Okay. So we are interested in maybe uh, just one candidate is enough for us. So what do I mean by these questions? For example, let's have a function like this. So this is f of x. This is a simple function. So 1 minus 1 over x. Now this is this. Let me try to sketch this. So at x is equal to 1, This is equal to zero, and it is approaching one. Okay, so this is one over x. It's flipped up and moved up. Okay, so the question is: Is there? Let's say that I want to maximize this. Is this problem? Does this problem have a solution or not? Well, one thing is, when I ask a problem like this, I should also define the domain of x. If I say that x is limited to this, let's say, close interval. Then you can say that, oh, of course, the maximum is this one. This is the minimum, okay? Because it's an increasing function. But if I define this domain of x as from zero, well, as from zero plus to infinity, then you see that there is no maxima, because this keeps on increasing, increasing, and increasing. So there is no maxima for this problem. So what we see is that, depending on the domain, optimal B hat or optimal solution of a problem may exist or may not exist, and depend, we have issues like that. So uniqueness is another question, and how we calculate this is a third question. This is the general mathematical reasoning. We are always answering similar questions. Okay, now let's go back to Let's say 3D case, which we are very familiar, because we want to use our everyday experience. So I'm still trying to define projection matrices, but I'm still far away from that. So let's see. 3D case. So I have only two vectors, this is a1, this is a2, and this is the zero vector. So this is the span of a1 and a2. Now there is a third vector, this is b. So I'm trying to find the optimal point at a minimum distance to b on this plane. So it's a two-dimensional picture right now. So what do I mean by a two-dimensional picture? Well, consider the following. Uh, let's assume that this plane is a two-dimensional, that is a whiteboard, is a two-dimensional plane. 
spent by a1 and a2. Maybe my a1 vector is this, the other vector is this. So any point on this white board is a linear combination of, as you see, something like that, these two points. Now, I'm trying to, let's say, tip of this board marker is the point B. So I'm trying to find the point on this board which is closest on this white board, which is close to the tip of this marker. So can it be this point? Can it be that point? Or can it be this, you know, just below it? This is what we call the projection operation, actually. I will explain it a little further. So this is the problem that we are trying to solve. Well, let's assume that there is a point, which I call this, again, B star. This B star is making you know, it's orthogonal to this plane. In other words, let me explain it further, sorry. So this is the vector B minus B star. So this B minus B star is orthogonal to this plane. So you may consider this some kind of an error, error vector. Again, tip of this board marker, if I select this over here, then this is the error, error vector. So I'm looking for a special one, if it exists or not. I don't, I don't know anything about that. So I'm having maybe just this point over here, which is making 90 degrees with the whiteboard. And this becomes a special point, B star. Okay. So if I have any other point, let's say something over here, so this is B1, another candidate. So what is the, now the question is, what is the distance, this distance? Well, since both of them are on this plane, so I can have another vector like that. And you can immediately see that this forms a triangle, okay? So I have two points and a third point is over here. Then I connect the other two points that will be the distance, distance between that. So from, let's say, Euclidean geometry, this is what's called Pythagorean's theorem. We know that distance square plus distance square of this, and if you take the square root of the sum, you get the distance over here. So what we see is that, for this special B1, B1, well, for given B1, B1 hat, I have the following. B minus B1 hat is equal to B minus B star hat, B minus or B1 minus B star. So what is it? This is Pythagoras theorem. Okay, so this is distance square, and this is standard Euclidean matrix. Sorry, Euclidean norm. That is, I have, well, x1 square, x2 square, x3 square, square root. Okay, that is the Euclidean norm. So. This is a result from Euclidean geometry. Now, what is important? If I can find a B star like this, then any other point on this plane, we can repeat the same thing. Then what we see is that for any other point, there is a right angle triangle, such as this one. And then the distance between B and the other candidate point becomes larger. Because what we have seen is this. Well, this is greater than or equal to zero. Norms are always greater than or equal to zero. So what we see is that, then to minimize this among all candidates, so I need a point which is, as what we say, orthogonal to this plane. Okay? That is it. Well, what is the projection operation? Projection operation is, 
let me write it over here. Projection operation is the mapping of B in this problem to optimal B star. Okay. So this is optimal IE closest distance vector. Okay. Closest distance vector. So that is called the projection operation. So I need an operator giving me this that will be returning me B, B star. Okay. Of course, you know, I can also generalize this problem. For example, this is a second projection case. So let's assume that I have a circle with radius r. So let's say it has a center C. So this is circle radius r. So this is a closed and convex set of points. So in other words, its interior is included boundaries included, set of points. So here is a question. If I have a point B over here, so I think you have understood the question. So which one of these points in on the circle is closest to this B? Again in the Euclidean sense, in the Euclidean norm sense. So how can I find that? So how do I find this? So this is a new problem. Well, this is first of all a uh, closed you know, set of points. The other one, well, it was infinitely extended. Now, let me define this point. So I need, a, again, B star, arc min, B minus, let's say B hat, where B hat is element of, let me show this set by C. So this is set C. For example, if I have a very fast computer, now I can calculate every point distance to this. This For every point I can calculate this distance and select the minimum. Okay? Again, there are many questions whether that minimum exists as in this problem or not. Well, okay. So how can I do this? So the basic, your reasoning will be correct. So let's assume that, for example, let's, so this is, let me move this, I couldn't draw the circle very well. Okay. So let's say that this is the set of points, let's say at distance one, around this given point B. So what do I see is this, all of these points inside of this circle are at a distance less than or equal to unit distance, to B. Okay. So as you see that, all of these points are, they are, none of these points are included in this constraint set C. So what do I do? I enlarge this circle. I enlarge this circle and finally if I enlarge it sufficiently enough, let me make this a little better, this part, it will be touching at a single point. Okay? Or I'm hoping that it will be touching at a single point, because I don't know anything about uniqueness or not. But let's assume that this drawing is correct. Okay. Now, from high school geometry, well, high school geometry is our best friend in this problem because as you see I'm not doing any calculations but just doing drawings. So if these two circles are tangent to each other, so at this point, at the tangency point, then 
it should be making a 90 degrees over here. And at this tangency point, if it exists, the other circle, forget about this one, then the red circle is tangent also, so it will also be making a 90 degrees. So it's a straight line. Okay. Well, so this seems to be a good candidate, but how can I be sure about that B star? B star is just at the boundary, and it seems to be a good candidate. For example, then let's take another point, this one. Let's say this is candidate B1 hat. Let me calculate, again, distance over here and this distance. So again, this forms a triangle. Okay. So this is, let me mark this somewhat more visible way. So this is our other candidate point, B1 hat, which is element of this constraint set. So this is the distance between this one and that one. So clearly we see that this is an obtuse angle, okay, or wide angle triangle, meaning that this distance is larger than this distance, because this triangle is obtuse. Well, okay, for this one it's okay. How about this one? Well, it's again obtuse. Because of this tangency, all of these points on this side, are uh, they are located on the left side of this, as you see. There is only one point over here on this straight line, which is marked with blue color. So all other points satisfying the constraint are on the left side. So whichever point I take, there is an obtuse angle. So this side of this triangle will be always larger than this one. And that will be showing that indeed, this is the optimal one. So if the solution exists, then it has to satisfy this kind of a condition. Okay? So, and how do you find this? Well, it's very efficient to find because let's say that my origin is somewhere over here. So I need to express this point. So this is C vector plus I need a vector pointing towards this direction. So this is B minus C vector, but this is supposed to be of, let's say, norm R. So let me make it unit norm, then multiply by R. So that becomes our optimal vector. Okay. So I'm solving the second projection case. So this time there is a constraint. Constraint set is you know, it's a finite, um, it's not a finite set, but it's a closed set as you see over here. And the solution of the problem is something you know, easy to see from this geometric discussion. So let me have a third example. Let me erase this part. third projection example. Now, let's have a set like this, maybe a semi-square, a semi-circle, and I have a point, let's say B over here, and this is our valid points. So this is set C. Again, the same problem. I'm looking for B optimal, which minimizes this and it should be, B hat should be an element of this set. Okay, now how can I find this? So for this one it was a little easy because of our geometric intuition we have written this answer immediately. So again, if we run the same cycle, if I draw these circles around here, I see that eventually the optimal point should be somewhere on this line. Okay? If I make the circles larger, 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 it will be somewhere along that line. So how about this? Now I'm getting more experience. 
So if I, let's say, select my B star according to this. Again, I'm using this angles, as you see, which we are used to in two-dimensional or three-dimensional problems, as you see over here. So any other point? Let's say this one, a candidate point, B1 hat. Well, again, there is this Pythagorean triangle, and B1 hat is not the closest one because this is closer than B1 had to be. Okay, any other point inside, obviously this becomes an obtuse triangle. As you see, this angle, angle discussion. So what we see is that for any other point, well, connecting this, I always have an obtuse triangle or triangle with a you know, right angle. So that tells me that, if this drawing is correct actually, then this B, B star is the optimal one, which is closest uh, point in the set C. Well, how can I express this mathematically? Well, I can say the following. Well, the optimal point, again, this is a closed convex set of points. Okay, convexity is important. Closest is important for the, you know, for the existence of solution, and so on. Okay, the optimal point, B star, has this kind of a property. Maybe you can remember this. So B minus B star B1 hat minus B star, let me write this, is less than or equal to zero. So what is this? Optimal point B star satisfies. So this is just an observation from this picture, but this will be the conclusion. If we do the derivation, it will be the conclusion. But let me explain this. So clearly, this vector, this vector is B minus B star, and this vector is, let me mark also with red, B1, this is the point B1, minus B star. So this is this vector. So what we see over here is, in Euclidean term, so this is called the inner product. Inner product of these two vectors is negative. Maybe you can remember from geometry. So this, this tells us that angle between B minus B star. Well, let me write these vectors. Angle between. So let me call this V1 vector. Let me call this V2 vector. Angle between V1 and V2. is obtuse or wide angle. Okay? So that tells us that this triangle is an obtuse triangle. So that is the condition. So if I find a, if I can find a B star satisfying this clearly from our from our geometric picture, obtuse triangle picture, right now it's expressed as in terms of inner products. So my comment is about projection operation. So all of these things, finding the nearest point on the constraint, let's say, sphere or constraint set, uh, which is nearest to the given point B, is the problem. So the mapping between B and the optimal B star will be the projection operation. Similarly, mapping between B to the B star is called the projection operation. Okay. So what we have seen, so in 2D or 3D examples given, the concept of 
angle angle turned out to be very useful for the decision of optimality. So this is to our luck because we are very much used to thinking in terms of 2D and 3D pictures. So we are used to considering angles and so on. So from those angle considerations that you have seen by triangles, etc. Okay, so we have decided the optimality of this B star. We have given some conditions even for the optimality of this B star. Now, to introduce angles, we need to define inner products. So, What's the inner product? Actually, we have just defined an inner product over there, but this was our usual, you know, inner product definition since that we are using since high school. So inner product again. So this is from n-dimensional vectors. Cartesian product of n-dimensional vectors is mapped to a real number. So what are the axioms for this? Number one. Okay. Number three. Number four. Sorry, this is greater than or equal to zero, and x is equal to zero vector. Okay, so these are the axioms for inner product. So the third important concept that we have seen in this lecture. Okay, so again, this is called symmetry. But you may say it's also called conjugate symmetry because I have written this like real numbers, but this can also be defined for from complex numbers to complex numbers to C. Okay? So if you have complex numbers, let's do not focus on this more complicated case, then you have a conjugate over here, but if you have only real valued factors, then this conjugate is not doing anything. Okay? So these two are called linearity conditions in first variable. Am I right? It's linear in the first variable. What do I mean by linearity? So I have superposition of two vectors, x and y, operated in terms of inner product by z. This is also a vector. The result is superposition of inner product results individually operated by z. Okay? So similarly, if you multiply x by lambda, a scalar, then you can move this lambda multiplication out of this inner product bracket, which is a notation for inner product. So you can calculate this first and then multiply the result by lambda. So this is linearity conditions. This is called the homogeneity condition and this is called the additivity condition for the linearity systems. And similarly, if arguments are the same, x, x, this inner product is supposed to be non-negative. And if this is 
x, x is equal to 0, the minimum, let's say, is 0 over here, then x has to be equal to 0. Okay. So, from, let's remember, let's write a brief note. Remember, usual inner product for Euclidean, let's say, geometry is if I have, let's say, x vector x1, x2, x3 and y vector y1, y2, y3 then x and y is simply x transpose or let me write this y transpose x okay so you can immediately see this satisfies all of these, okay? Y transpose X, or this is equal to X1, Y1, X2, Y2, X3, Y3, okay? So individual elements are multiplied and you just sum them up. So this is the usual inner product definition that we are used to from you know, Euclidean geometry. Now again, here is a claim. So given an inner product, given a valid inner product, let's say x and y, we can define a norm in this form. Okay. Let me see. This is the norm square in this form. So this is called again, or let me put okay, norm square. So this is called induced norm. Induced norm by inner products. Okay. So is can this be correct? So here are this is the reason that I haven't erased this part. So what was this? So these are the axioms for norm function. So norm function has to satisfy this. So let's see. So norm function condition number one. So norm of x is equal to zero if and only if x is equal to zero. So easy case. If x is equal to zero, zero, zero has the inner product of zero because no problems with this. Now, if this inner product is equal to zero, x and x is equal to zero, then x has to be equal to zero. So what we see is that if this norm is equal to 0, x is equal to 0, so we, ha we have satisfied the first axiom. Well, this will be taking a while. Okay, let's skip this one. The third one. So a norm, this norm definition has to satisfy this. So if I multiply this by alpha, so let me do this. Alpha times x, this is square. It is supposed to be alpha x, alpha x. Okay, but this is alpha goes out because of linearity. So I have alpha square x x. So this is alpha square x norm. So what we see is this: if you take the square root of this, alpha x. If you t if you compare this part with this part, then okay. So this is also square over here. So we see, we get exactly like this. So third one is also satisfied, only the remaining one is the second one. This is called the triangle inequality. So I need to satisfy this triangle inequality, but checking the triangle inequality will be, let's see, So 
so we need to only verify triangle inequality axiom for the norm to prove that the induced norm by inner product is indeed a norm i.e. let's say let me put the square root over here I have something like that so this is our definition so I'm trying to show that this is indeed a norm function satisfying those axioms so to show triangle inequality we will first prove another important result called Cauchy Schwartz Cauchy Schwartz inequality. Let me write this Cauchy Schwartz inequality, the definition of it, and then that will be the end of this lecture. So Cauchy Schwartz. Again, this is a very fundamental result. Let me write inequality. So if I have x and y in its product, so the magnitude of this is this. Okay. Okay, this is the Cauchy Schwarz inequality. So inner product of vectors x and y, if you take the magnitude of this inner product, so it's a positive quantity right now absolute value or the magnitude then this is smaller than product of the norms of x and y okay this is a very fundamental result in engineering we are using it at many different places and we will make use of this to prove to prove the triangle inequality axiom for this you know, induced norm function over here okay so we will continue from that point in the next hour